Hey everybody, welcome to the Base Shed Podcast. My name is Ryan Roberts. How's everybody doing? I'm, uh, I'm actually going to wait for you to respond. How, how you doing? You good? Uh-huh. Yeah. All right, all right, cool. On the show with me today is Jamie Silverstein. Jamie is a multi-platinum selling record producer, songwriter, multi-instrumentalist. Uh, I initially met him as a bass player uh, in New York years ago. Uh, Jamie has worked with Miguel, Alicia Keys, J. Cole, Snoop Dogg, Estelle, a whole lot of other people. Um, and uh, the conversation we had, I, I, was, uh, I was really looking forward to doing it. We went, we went long, so I'm going to release this as two episodes. And this is episode one. With Jamie Silverstein. All right, dope. We're live. So you got an interesting story. I do? <laughs> well, maybe not to you because you lived it. Like, I don't think mine's that interesting. It's just life. Yeah, pretty um, much. I'm, I'm really fascinated. And we were just talking about this while I was setting up. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm fascinated to have you in here. Because, like, when, we were, when I reached out to you in the text thread, like, right away, you're like, dude, thanks. But uh, you sure? You sure you want me? And yeah, I, and I'm like, yes, absolutely. Okay, because you got strong opinions about it, um, and it's not that you were unequipped to absolutely like you're a really talented musician. You're educated. Mm-hmm. Um, you had some ho- high profile gigs, mm-hmm. <coughs> so there's. It's not like you were trying to do something that you were unequipped for. If anything, you were probably over equipped for the work you do do. Thank you. That's very generous of you. Yeah. No, I've heard you play, uh, and it's like, damn, okay. Like, I remember when you got to town, and I'm like, all right, I know of him from New York. But then when I heard you play, I'm like, okay, yeah, Jamie can play. Cool. Thank you. Um, and so how would you classify your uh, – I agree with a lot of what you have to say, and we were talking about this too. Uh, but I'm going to let you put it in your own words. Um, Where's your headspace at right now about – about bass playing. I'll start there. Uh, um, <laughs> okay. Um, should we preface this by like who I am or anything like or just go right into um, it? I mean, I'm, I'm going to do a thing on the front end. You, okay. uh, we can talk about it. I do want to hear like, let's actually get to. Dude, that's a great question. I mean, I, we can do it. I just. Yeah. I just don't want people to be like, okay, who's let, this, let's, who's this let's do that. Asshole? Let's do that. Let's, where's your head about at bass playing? And then we'll go all the way back and talk about how you got there. Okay, um, so here's we'll start with the answer. Okay, here's what I think about musicians. Okay. Um, okay, so like when jazz was big, jazz basically, you know, like Miles Davis or Louis Armstrong before that, you know, basically they were putting their spin on the popular music of yeah, the day. Right. Right? And, um, and basically they were like playing relevant songs that people like they were just putting their spin on it mm-hmm. i just think the scene of local musicians are we're playing songs that are 40 50 years old like no one gives a shit about autumn leaves no <laughs> within, one within jazz right yeah yeah right even within jazz and then like how many like when i came to town to get on gigs it was actually pretty easy because i was like okay i just need to know stevie wonder songs and michael yeah. jackson songs yeah that's it but but like why Shaka. like like yeah. why were why weren't people learning songs of the day mm, like more history yeah, it, yeah yeah it's like basically musicians i feel like musicians don't have a healthy respect a healthy awareness or or respect of what's going on today so it's like okay. you a musician will go and you know he's just playing his funk licks. Yeah. That you know he, maybe he transcribed some Anthony Jackson <laughs> or some Bootsy Collins right. or whatever it is, and it's like you're trying to fit that over. Well, I guess you're just playing the old music. But when but then when you do get a gig and you do get a, a big pop gig or something, you're just like playing this vocabulary from the '70s. Yeah. Over the new stuff. Right. And it's like, it's funny. I learned really quickly to to be on a big gig. It's not about your playing. Right. It's about how cool you look. Yeah. Basically, you need to look and like your you're connect having that got you there. Hmm? And and the connect that got you there, right? Yeah. Like I'm For sure you you got on that gig. The gig was Miguel. Right. We can we talk about that. Yeah. And you worked with Miguel for how many years? Uh, five years. Okay. And you got the gig because you knew DMD or you knew somebody else in the band. 
Um, actually, the way I got that gig was interesting. I was living in New York, and um, uh, basically I went to school out in New York, Manhattan School of Music. Yeah. And then um, I stayed for three years after that. So I had seven years in New York. And um, Did you graduate? I did graduate. Okay. Um, kicking and screaming, though. Yeah. How did like, you, you work in the school environment? Like, school is not for me. Oh, no, no, no. I, basically, I was into it. I was into playing upright for two years, and then, um, I mean, I was playing for years before that, obviously, to get into that school, but uh, basically, I, I spent the summer in New York one time and was just, like, hustling gigs. Yeah. Like, $30, $40, $50 gigs right. with my base, my base wheel at the bottom. Yeah. You know, and then yeah. I had to cart my amp, uh -huh. and I was just like, dude, this is no way to live. This is so fucking <laughs> stupid. I right. can't believe anyone. Not that, like, and obviously, if you're a stand-up bass player and you're on the higher end of things, there are guys making a great living doing that. But I just didn't love it enough to, to you know, sweat it out for those years coming up on those gigs. The the hustle of like the um, the ins and outs of being a working musician, like the getting the gigs, the what do I got to wear, like all those little things, mm -hmm. or the actual playing. Like once you were on the stage and you're like in it with Catch You Dig, it was cool. Or yeah, still just like eh. I mean, electric bass has always been my thing. Yeah. Like basically, uh, I started playing electric bass when I was twelve. I was playing classical piano before that, which I hated. My mom made me do it. Was that the first instrument? Yeah. Piano? Okay. Yeah. And then 12, uh, bass was my choice. And then junior year, uh, I went to a public school, but we were like a, a really good music public school. Yeah. Um, Agora High School. Okay. And um, uh, my music, my band director, John Mosley, he was like, you know, Jamie, you, you know, you play the bass pretty good, but if you want to be shit in this world, like you got to start playing upright and you got to get into Manhattan School of Music. Yeah. And, and I was just like, all right, well, if you say so, you yeah. know, just like blindly listening. And um, <clears throat> so then I dropped electric for a year or two and then got like decent at upright. I've never been the best upright player. Man, it's it's such a demanding, unforgiving instrument. Yeah. Like even if you get some stuff together, you take like two days off. Yeah. And you just feel like you went back three years. Yeah. It's a. Uh, I also, just like the position of like I'm the guy who's walking, I'm just like pounding out chord <laughs> notes. I was like, I just feel like everyone's bitch. Like I just, <laughs> it's like the trumpet player gets to just play whatever the fuck he wants, yeah. and the piano player gets to go ape shit in jazz, yeah. and like I have to pound out roots and fifths, yeah. and like <laughs> like chromatic connecting tone. I was like, this isn't for me. What was it for you? So let let's go um, let's go back. You're from Agora. I was born in New York. Okay, we're in New York. Um, Manhattan. Okay, Washington Heights. Siblings. Uh, younger brother, yeah. Okay. Uh, any other musicians in the family? Um, like not professionally necessarily, but if I told you, you wouldn't believe me. Uh, okay. I'm related to James Brown. <laughs> really? Yeah. Well, that's dope. How close? Um, I think he's my mom's cousin. Oh, that's killing. Yeah. Okay. Never met him or anything. Right. But uh, yeah, and then my uncle on my dad's side, um, he's a guitar teacher in Manhattan. Okay. So it's in the family. So then, what was the music growing up? Motown. Like what was, uh, yeah, Motown. okay, Motown, yeah, old my, funk. Yeah, my dad, um, my Jewish dad, he was just super into black music. Yeah. And really early on, he's like, Jamie, this is James Jamerson. Like, this is it right here. Yeah. And he just kind of started he's me on that. He's not wrong. Yeah. <laughs> like and, then, and then after that, it was, you know, um, he showed me Marvin Gaye. Mm -hmm. And, like, I didn't know who I was listening to at the time, but, like, um, I just remember, like, rollerblading downstairs in the basement my dad would be playing these soul records yeah and so were you playing piano yet or this was pre-piano um i was playing piano but i was like playing bach and beethoven it's whatever like, the teacher had you go through. yeah like that hadn't connected yet sure and then when i <clears throat> when i started playing bass when i was 12 um my family moved to agora and i was into like skateboarding and yeah. so like my first uh, my first bass influences were actually like ska bands. Okay. Like uh, like Real Big Fish, The Hippos. Yeah. Um, like mid to late '90s era. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I had like the Music Man Stingray. Yeah. And right. uh, the Sublime dude. Yeah. Yeah. That that was my shit. And then and then I was into Flea. Of course. Um, really, my first serious bass influence though was Stuart Zender from Jamiroquai though. Oh yeah. He was the guy that I just like. I had like posters of him right. up in my room. I just like learned all his bass lines. When he like, did traveling without moving and Funk Odyssey, or Funk Odyssey was the guy his the first record he was replaced on. I remember that was the one he that was the first one he was replaced on. Okay, but traveling he did, he without didn't, moving was amazing. The ones before that were even better bass wise. Oh really? Yeah, traveling without moving was like the best songwriting. Yeah, yeah. But uh, um, 
space space cowboy and right right i do have that the, I know what you meant. the yeah. one before that yeah those man he was just he was just amazing to me yeah yeah those lines are sick yeah right and like he doesn't know the fretboard or something there's something i remember reading about him that was pretty appalling it's like all just ear really yeah like he doesn't know now i could be completely wrong and if he ever heard this he'd be like what the hell is this guy talking about <laughs> But I seem somehow I seem to have it in my mind that he just doesn't know the notes on the fretboard. And Man, whatever, h- however you do it. Yeah, I agree with there's that. There's a there's a bass player in town. Um, I probably shouldn't I shouldn't say his name, but he's like very proud about not knowing the fretboard, and he has like the biggest gigs. Oh yeah, like the biggest gigs. <laughs> like like Queen B. Right. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. All right. So you're growing up. You're listening to Motown. Mm-hmm. Um, what's what age? That was twelve when you started playing. Yeah. Okay. So between twelve and Manhattan School of Music, are you taking bass lessons? Yes. Okay, you're taking bass lessons. Mm-hmm. You like, you got a ska band together with some buddies or something? Um, actually, when I started a band, by that point we were really into like Three Eleven and Incubus. Oh yeah, Peanut. Yeah. yeah. I was talking about Peanut on another podcast. Yeah. So, yeah. Peanut. Oh my God, I was so, I was so into him too. Yeah. And uh, yeah. I had a band kind of like that, and and at that time I was dabbling in jazz. So I remember I thought I was like changing the world yeah. by having like minor seventh chords instead of power chords. <laughs> I was like, oh, I was like, someday the world is gonna hear my musical. Vi-. I thought I was like, yeah, the next coming of something, <laughs> yeah. just for like putting sevens in chords. Yeah, and then I went to New York and I was like, oh, <laughs> I gotta figure out something else. <laughs> so what got, what was it that got you into jazz? Was it a specific bass player or a record or just? The idea of like, huh, I want to be good, and this seems like you got to be good to do it. You know what? A- exactly that. That, that it was, was it th- for me, too. It was kind of the virtuosity of like... Like, I want to be a badass, and apparently you got to do that to be a badass. Exactly. Yeah. And, and I, I did genuinely love... There were some jazz albums that I did genuinely love. I mean, mm-hmm. I did have my jazz time where I did love jazz. Yeah. But, I mean, the first time I heard Kind of Blue, I was like, holy shit, this is amazing. Yeah. And, and really... My, my jazz guy is still like I still listen to him is Wayne Shorter. Oh yeah. I just think he's the best writer out of all of them. <sighs> I love his. Like name. basically, Miles, Miles' music means a lot to me. Wayne's music means a lot to me, and Brian Blade Fellowship. Oof. That's like. Do you have Mama Rosa? That record is my jam. Yeah. Where he sings on it. Yeah, I was uh, I was into the stuff like a few years before that. Uh yeah, what's that? Right, I know the record. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like I I remember when we when I was in college. He was playing at the Vanguard, and uh, it was like 30 bucks to get in. It was like so expensive for me back then. I yeah. was like the most broke college student. <laughs> and, and I went and saw it twice. And, I was, and he would uh, – I'd just never seen Brian Blade play before. Okay. And like the room would just stare at him the whole time. Yeah. It's like there would be a band of like nine people, and you would just be locked on Brian Blade. Yeah. Because like every, every hit on the drums meant so much to him. Yeah. It was like It was like – an emotional cathartic thing like he'd crash on a cymbal and it would just be like yeah like i've it's like i'd never seen someone love something as much as he yeah, loved he was playing the drums it. the first time i saw him play was at the old jazz bakery here mm-hmm. i don't know if you were in town when it was still in like culver city no no no, no i wasn't oh, okay um so i saw him play there with Petitucci trio mm-hmm. and um yeah like it was amazing yeah like I didn't, and of all the records I have him on, him live is a completely different thing. Right. And every time I had gone to the bakery to see Heroes play, it's like, yeah, that's cool. And they sound exactly like the record, like exactly like the record live, Mm. but not Blade. Like Blade was just like, yeah, something completely different. He's he's just so special. Yeah. Oh oh yeah. I I have to, I should mention the, uh, the other Jazz records that really floored me was what my uh, what Winton was doing in the eighties. Okay, like Black Codes from the Underground, all that shit. Right, I've listened to some of those. I don't, I don't think I have any of those. Like that period of music, that period of jazz, the eighties thing. I never really found anything that you got to check it out. Yeah. So you never like got into Jeff Tane Watts? I mean, I, yeah, like I've heard it. You he, know, but he was literally just like Elvin Jones. On PCP, yeah, like it's so crazy what he does. I got I got hip to him first because of Brecker Records. Oh, okay, yeah, uh, there was like just after that, like the like early nineties, uh, 
Brecker. Yeah, when Brecker was doing those records with like Dave Holland and Dee and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right, so <clears throat> that's where you're at. You're learning jazz. Mm-hmm. Um, this is before you get to Manhattan. Um, what else is happening musically? You still playing piano at all? Uh, I mean, I have to take piano in school. So at Manhattan. before you get to school, no, between like twelve and Manhattan, that oh. period of time. Um, getting into jazz for the first time. Yeah, I'm just transcribing okay. records. Yeah. Um, to be honest, I'm feeling a lot of self-esteem because I was naturally good at the bass. Like I learned sure. it really quickly. Yeah. And um, <laughs> I was like a chubby kid who like wasn't good at skateboarding and I like, okay. wasn't good at sports. Sure. Um, so bass was really the first thing that I was good at. Yeah. And like everybody knew it. Like yeah. I, I had respect around school and like people wanted to play with me. And it's funny. Same, same here. Like yeah. I just couldn't lock in anywhere else. But then this, like I found like I hit my thing. Yeah. Yeah. And then being a musician just tore me down, actually. <laughs> <laughs> we'll come back to that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's so sad how that happens. All right. So, um, yeah, you're feeling like you found your thing in life and you're pursuing it. Yeah. Uh, you get to Manhattan. Mm-hmm. You're starting. Uh, what, what age did you start upright? Two years before Manhattan? Yeah. So probably like 16 years old. Okay. Did you do all the classical rap too, or just like straight to jazz? Just straight to jazz. Okay. I didn't give a shit about classical right, music. Right. I think it's great when I hear it done. Yeah. Like I love solo bass rap and all that stuff. It's like I don't think I have the the thing to like stick it out and shed it. Well, to me, like I. But have I do love it. For for me, and this is gonna I'm gonna sound like such an asshole, <laughs> but. It's a safe space. Okay, cool. <laughs> I just don't understand why anyone would want to wake up and just like play someone else's ideas note for note. That's like like if that's the thing that makes you just wake like want to wake up and just like that's your connection to music. I just don't get it. Right. Like like if like I have uh, I I get why Ravel or Debussy or Stravinsky like I get what makes them want to wake up like sure. they're just pouring. Yeah. ideas out of out of their heart and their, their brain onto the page and then they hear it back from all the world's best musicians like right. that's fucking and awesome they're writing for this big group and there's so much power in it yeah but if you're like cello three <laughs> like like i i just like no disrespect to cello players no, like cello's not cello three like you know someone's making a living playing cello three exactly yeah. but like i just don't get it yeah you know and and like he wakes up and he's excited to play music that's 300 years old yeah like i just yeah, I don't know. I, I'm curious about that, too. And um, there's a friend of mine who I'm going to get on doing a podcast, and he's assistant principal mm-hmm. uh, in a symphony. I won't say which one, because if, if the podcast doesn't work out, he's going to, you know, whatever. Mm. Um, but I want to talk to him about that, because his undergrad, no, his master's was in jazz, and then his doctorate was in classical, I think. Mm-hmm. So it's like, man, why? Like, yeah, you know. And, and you know, it's funny. When I was in college, uh, Manhattan School of Music was half – uh, they had a classical division and a jazz division. And, you know, it's freshman year, like, everyone's wiling, wiling out. Everyone's fucking. Everyone's drinking. Everyone's yeah. doing their thing. Like and a lot of cats the first time they're away from home and they're in New York and it's party mode. Yeah, but really, the classical kids went so hard. Like, the yeah. classical kids would be puking all over the floor, <laughs> sleeping in the hallway, <laughs> All the repression is being... Yeah, yeah, all the repression of being classical. Yeah. The jazz guys, we would just, like, drink whiskey and play poker. Right, and it's just like, another Like, watch Tuesday. foreign movies. Yeah. <laughs> like, just on some cool shit. The classical musicians would go ape shit. Like, and, and, and I can't help but think that, like, the jazz musicians were expressing ourselves all the time. Sure. So, like, yeah, I'll just chill out and have a sandwich and watch a movie with my buddies. <clears throat> Whereas the classical musicians, it's like they're being told what to do, probably in like a pretty aggressive, demeaning way, twenty four seven. Sure. And then it's like on the weekend they just fucking go crazy. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how that how the mind of a classical musician works or like what the emotional makeup of it is, but it's. There's a perfectionist aspect even the, in the jazz musician. You know, you have to nail this thing. This thing has to feel a certain way. Sure. Or people beating themselves up about how they're making changes or not. Um, but there's not – I don't think it's – it's held to a more individual standard. Right. Right? Like you just – you play the changes like you want to play the changes as long as you're not losing the form and you got the bases covered. The classical thing, I don't know. I, I, I don't understand it. Like it's really – it's the same kind of mentality that, like, maybe a suburban household has. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I can't connect with it because I don't have it. 
I don't know what that's like to wake up every day in a house you own and go to the same job, you know, and have a couple kids and like that life is foreign to me. And I think the same about classical musicians. Well, I've talked to them about it because I've honestly asked the question because it's bewildered me ever since I was aware Did of. Did you ever get like an honest, like really guttural? Well, they said they said that there is room for expression. And I didn't want to like yeah. further demean <laughs> them by like, what do you mean? Like when you switch bow or something? Like, yeah, yeah. Like they're right, if you're going up to bow or down bow. Like yeah, that's but, your but actually, I don't even think they can do that because like, for instance, I'm, le- I'm a left-handed bass player. Yeah. At one point, I was taking classical lessons at uh, Manhattan just because I wanted to get my technique better, you know? With Oren? Um, who? Oren O'Brien? Because she was there, right? Um, no. Um, David. I forget his name. Uh-huh. But he even told me, he's like, look, um, if you get good, that's fine, but like, you'll never be in an orchestra. And I was like, oh. He's like, yeah, you're left-handed. Like, that would just be such a clusterfuck. Oh, because of the way your bow's going. Yeah, he's yeah. like, you can, you'll just never work as yeah. a classical musician unless you want to switch right now <laughs> like no no i don't yeah so huh yeah that's kind of a buzzkill too like uh, uh, no love maybe lost. not yeah right it wasn't your thing yeah so you're at manhattan you study jazz in manhattan yeah okay um getting deeper into the music at this point <coughs> did you where what did this do to your your emotional attachment to the music did school burn you out on it a little bit or did you start to uncover it as as you were learning it and you're like, oh man, this there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff here that, and you fell in love with it more, man. Or but I was because school can burn you out. Like I got burnt out several times. Yeah, I was such an asshole in school. Like the teachers, the teachers did not like me. There was one teacher who really did uh, help me out though, um, Gerard D'Angelo. He was my improv teacher. Um, Actually, you know, it's funny. I, I always seem to forget this, but this a very pivotal moment for me in school was I got tendinitis. Ooh. And um, basically, sophomore year, so basically, I come in freshman year, and I'm like the best bass player coming from Agora. Mm-hmm. But then, you know, you go to this, this uh, you know, high-level conservatory, and then you realize very quickly that the best people from all over the world yeah. are now here. Right. And I wasn't one of the stronger kids freshman yeah. year at all. Sure. And then uh, the summer of sophomore year, I went to uh, Brevard Jazz Academy. It was like the summer camp for uh, jazz musicians. And I actually started to like step into my own a bit on the bass. And like people okay. started to notice me and the older cats wanted to play with me. Oh, dope. And, um, and then sophomore year, I was like super, super, super into it. And then I had that summer where I stayed there and I was like, oh, this is the life of the jazz musician. This is crazy. Yeah. And then coincidentally, I also got tendinitis okay. around that time. And, uh, and that was crazy. I went from playing like six hours a day to you've got to take a month off. Then you can play for a minute a day. You can play for five minutes build a day, it back up. 10 minutes a day. And um, it, took, it took months to get it back. Like I would have recitals or... Um, you know, like performances to do that I wasn't even able to practice for. Yeah. Because if the recital was an hour, uh, that there was my hour for that day. Yeah. So it, you know, um, and even by senior year, it was definitely something that I was still nursing. Okay. You know, and then I kind of just took that as like the universe telling me like, this isn't your This instrument. isn't it. Do you still feel it at all? Like things flare up? Um, I think if I started practicing upright again, mm-hmm. um, Probably. Yeah. Probably I would. Okay. I don't know if that you ever like totally heal from that. Yeah, I don't know. I don't. I had a teacher that had it once and he he was on like some meds for it, but I don't yeah. know what happened. But he was also like old and wasn't playing regularly. Mm. So it's not like he was playing four or five nights a week and still had to right. deal with his tendonitis. Yeah. <coughs> um, but yeah, to continue my uh, my experience in school. So after the tendonitis, um, I started to play electric more just because it was yeah. less demanding physically. Absolutely. And the way that the students and teachers reacted to it was like super not cool. Did they look down on you? Yeah, very much so. Yeah. And um, there were there were the kids that were into it, like the kind of fusion kids or the kids that were listening to R&B and gospel and all that kind of stuff. But, but there wasn't like a kind of a nature of progressive jazz teachers there or anything? Oh, hell no. That were just like, yeah, that's... You know, part of this music, too. No, absolutely not. They, in fact, um, during my recital, one of my recitals, uh, I was playing electric, 
and they just like weren't into it. And I had a, I'll be honest, I had a really shitty attitude because I knew they weren't going to be into it. And I was right. like, whatever, fuck them. Yeah. You know, I, I definitely had this attitude of like, my parents are paying your salaries. Right. I should at least get to learn what I want to learn. Yeah. Like this shit costs over a hundred thousand dollars. Right. Like I at least want to learn what I want to learn, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and they didn't like that, but, um, they, w- I remember one teacher actually told me, she said, Jamie, I don't think you paid attention when you were applying for schools. Cause this is a conservatory. Think about what the title conservatory means. We're trying to conserve the art of jazz. Okay. We're, we're not necessarily trying to push it forward. We're trying to conserve it. And it's such a funny thing to me, right? They're trying to conserve <laughs> a bunch of dudes who are pushing it forth. Yeah. What, th- what they're conserving is the idea of pushing it forward. Well, they want to conserve the spirit of pushing it forward from 1930 to 1970-something. Right, right, right. Yeah. So, like, if, you, if you're pushing it forward a la Ron Carter or a la uh, Slam Stewart yeah. or Ray Brown, like, great. Sure. Good on you. Yeah. But if you're, pu- if you're pushing it forward like Jaco Pistorius, right. who also played with Wayne Shorter as well yeah. as Ron yeah. Carter, it's like they just weren't having it. Yeah. I just, I just finished this whole blog post uh, about Jimmy Blanton. Oh, cool. And, uh, and I didn't know much about the dude, and I went all the way back. Like, mm-hmm. like the original dudes. Um, and it's funny that when you think about preserving and anything that is going to preserve the nature, like <coughs> the music, this music, in, I mean, from what I know, I'm not a jazz historian, but it progressed so fast. Mm-hmm. I mean, from like 1910 to, I don't know, whatever, let's say 70s, you know, when electronic music came out and funk got involved and uh, you know, a lot of those crossover records are kind of coming out. Mm-hmm. I, don't know, I don't know if you'd call them a crossover record, but that's the 70s. So in 60 years, like this music both began and, and then petered out or stopped being culturally relevant. Well, I think as it became, uh, dare I say, more masturbatory, sure. that's when it started to peter out. I mean, you like... You think that happened to bebop? Yeah. Well, no, but people still... I mean, because Miles was still big, like, decades after Bebop, you know? Mm -hmm. But, for instance, like, Louis Armstrong was playing from a totally different spirit than Miles was. Absolutely. Like, Louis was, like, you know, this this ray of joy, and he wanted to entertain people, and he was here for the people. And, like, Miles would play with his back to the audience. He's like, "If if you're not cool enough to get this, then fuck you. Right. And that became the ethos of jazz. Yeah. And that's why people like don't care about it today. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I mean, that's, I love the nature of what it should be, if that makes sense. Yeah. Which is this kind of personal uh, expression mm-hmm. in a communal sense and everybody working together and the social aspects of it and the fact that it's such, so American. Right. You know, um, those are the things I love about it. And the, in the, improvisation, you know, creating on the spot. Love that stuff. Yeah. But this elitism thing sure. about it. And um, I had a couple failed attempts at school, and I wanted to go to a school in New York specifically to study with teachers. Like, I would only apply at the school where I wanted to study with the guy. Yeah. And uh, I couldn't – I don't know if I could really – I don't think I would have survived. One, I don't think I would have survived New York at that age. Hmm. Like – New, I would have, I would have tried to keep up with New York, yeah, and I would have died. Uh, yeah, it can get pretty. pretty I, I depressing. tried to do it my first couple of years in L.A. Like I tried to keep up with L.A. Mm-hmm. and that just that didn't go well. Well, I, I mean, I think you just find your circle and you find yeah. Um, back to the elitism thing. Yeah. I have a, I, I do have a hard time with that in jazz, mm-hmm. uh, and because it's, it that I don't know, it doesn't need to happen at all. Like, at what point did it turn in? to this, this music that came from the trenches and like really, you know, kind of people in some rough stuff in life mm-hmm. who had something to say, but it was also an escape for them to check me out. Like, I, I'm, I don't know where that line happened, <laughs> but it, damn, did it happen. And it's so uninteresting. Yeah, well, also, I mean, one of the lamest things about jazz is the only people that go to see jazz are musicians. Right. 
So it's like you're playing and then everybody's kind of like transcribing you as they listen. And it's just like, this isn't what right. music's supposed to be. Yeah. I mean, I guess it's a, it's a form of music, but. <coughs> if someone can connect with it, that's cool. I mean, you know, it's all about, I think music is, is about different people in different places. So if people connect with this thing for whatever yeah. reason, that's great. Uh, I, I, I don't a lot. Yeah. I don't connect with a lot of modern jazz. Yeah, and, and like I said, there are jazz uh there are jazz artists that I absolutely love. Sure. Me but too. you know, it's very few and far between. Yeah. Like I remember I saw um this jazz concert, uh this guitarist. I mean, I don't fucking know this guy, whatever, it's Adam Rogers. Okay. And uh No, I I mean I know of him. I yeah, know, but I don't know him personally. Yeah, I don't know him personally. Dude, I remember I was at the jazz gallery and this guy took Upwards of nine choruses on Body and Soul. <laughs> like, it was like a slow ballad, right? right? Sure. And, you know, you go to the jazz gallery, and I think they, they play hour sets. Okay. He spent 20 minutes on a ballad. Sure. And I was just thinking, I was like, what a fucking asshole. Yeah. Like, this guy is such a selfish asshole to make people listen to him just, like, nut all over a ballad. <laughs> like, you re- like, you really think, like, you really think you're saying something? Like, it's a, like... I just couldn't believe it. That was one of the moments that made me hate jazz. Okay. And if he's listening, like, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Come at me, bro. Well, I, I mean, it's true. It's just like that's like the spirit that makes you do that is like it, that's everything that's wrong with the music. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I don't know him. I, don't, I, don't, I feel bad judging him. Like, whatever. He's made a career doing that. That's fine. Yeah. I mean, people people like it. It's I, and, <coughs> and to be honest, I went to go see him. Because I had a bunch of his albums. Like, I sure. totally loved his shit. Yeah. But that just, like, left such a bad taste in my mouth for jazz. I was like, I, was like, I don't want any part of this. So, like, even as a jazz musician at this time, how old were you? Were you going to school? So you're a jazz student? Or yeah. this is after school? No, after school, I was, like, done with jazz. Okay. I was done with jazz um, by senior year of school. In fact, I was I wanted to drop so out. So after the tendonitis and after the upright thing was kind of like, yeah, that's not for me. Yeah. Jazz well, went away with the upright. Pretty much. I mean, I got called to go on a tour. I wanted to drop out of school, but my parents wouldn't let me. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I said to them, I was like, but I'm going to school so I get good enough to get called for tours right. like this. Sure. So like, I just yeah. finished early, like met my goal. <laughs> yeah, right. And, uh, and they're like, no, you know, we, we want you to have a degree and I'm thinking to myself like a degree in jazz bass like are you fucking kidding me right i I know i sound like so ungrateful but what do your parents do professionally my dad is a radio promoter like basically he gets records from record labels played on the radio oh dope yeah so i grew up with music and then my mom's stay-at-home mom okay but uh like to be honest if and when i ever have kids if they want to pursue music i would have them i'd have them go to school for one year yeah. So they can have the experience of like oh, freshman year drinking, fucking all that stuff. Because yeah. like that, you know, that happens like only once in your life unless you go on tour. Then it's your <laughs> life. But um, I would say like pick a city, yeah. like pick, pick a style of music first off, because no one really wants a jack of all trades. Like right. pick the thing that you're going to be the best at. Um, you can go to school for a year and then I would just give them money to live. Like here's your rent money. Here's your food money. And here's your money to go network. Yeah. Like I want you to. I want you to go out at least four times a week. Right. Tell me what you're doing. Check in with me. And I guarantee you my child would go farther than any student. Yeah. Like not on, not on some debauchery, but on some like, yo, show up, don't get crazy and like be purposeful about your hang. Yeah. Like who, like whoever you want to say, it's Christian McBride, like go see Christian show. Here's 50 bucks. Get him a drink. Right. Talk to him. Yeah. And like what, what my child would learn just from like, first off, he'd be the best networker, which is everything now. Right. And he, he would just get into all the scenes, and he'd start hanging and playing with better people. I mean, he'd be so much further ahead than anyone. He'd be grandfathered in in a different way. Yeah, yeah, which is, you know, way better than the degree, unless he wants to teach, you know, at a university. Yeah, <coughs> which I don't even know. Uh, I don't even know what that's like anymore. You know, like that has to be because of internet. And I mean, I can't be hypocritical. Like I'm doing it with this. I'm yeah. releasing lessons. Sure. Um, there's an they can get stuff at a university, but even the dudes at the university are doing the online thing. So yeah. what is institutionalized education going to be like for the arts? Like, Yeah. And you know what's funny is like you can get a degree so you can hopefully teach at a university, but they're just going to hire the dude who's 
Who do pull the students? Yeah, yeah, like like didn't they didn't some school give uh, Wayne Shorter an honorary doctorate? Uh, that recently? was recent, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. recently. I was like, he didn't go to school, but like that's who anyone would want to study yeah, with, right? Not the dude who like went through the system and dotted his eyes, yeah, his eyes yeah, and crossed exactly. his T's, and like, who wants to study with that motherfucker? Right, exactly. Like you want to do somebody who is a creative force. Yeah, yeah, right. I I think if I remember correctly, Patatucci doesn't have a degree. I remember I spoke to him about that. Yeah, but I can't remember. I studied with a dude named Joel DeBartolo, who was the bass player on the Carson Show, the whole run of the show. Okay, and when he moved to Arizona. He was trying to get a teaching gig, and they're like, yeah, no. But, but like, it's what? hilarious. Like, he's been on TV every night. Yeah. You know, every weeknight for 25 years. It, top call LA session guy, all that stuff. And, like, they wouldn't give him a gig. Eventually, they did. He yeah. Got, he got the gig. But it was it was a pain. Yeah. So there's a lot of politics there, which is, that's a different conversation. Yeah. Um, all right. So, you get burnt out on jazz around senior year. What are you doing the three years after you graduate in New York? Um, you're just playing gigs. Are you getting into production and songwriting? Uh, I started getting into production while I was in school. Okay. Um, like on the side or through classes and stuff. I mean, I doubt they had classes. There was that. one class, but it was super remedial. Okay. And it was like it was like teaching you digital performer, and I was like, dude, no one uses digital performer. <laughs> right, right, like, right. I'll stick to Logic, thank you. Yeah. And, you but know, did you have like some homies already on the scene in New York who are like doing it and turning out music? And producing? No, I was literally the only person. I think I had like maybe two friends, but we all sucked. Like we were, we were just learning. Okay. But um, basically, so I was just a total punk ass in school. And there was one teacher who actually cared enough about me to say, Jamie, I know you don't want to do this. What do you actually want to do? Oh, man, like, that's amazing. Like, how can I help you? Yeah, yeah. And I said, well, you know, I, I want to I play bass. I want to go on tour and I want to produce. And um uh, shout out to Gerard D'Angelo if you ever hear this. Like you, you were amazing to me. Great. And uh, he said, "This is what we're gonna do. Don't disrespect me in class." And I didn't. I never disrespected him. I was yeah. super. I didn't really try to disrespect any of the teachers. I sound like a fucking asshole. But, um, <laughs> it just came he, natural. <laughs> he, he was. He was basically like. He was like respect the lesson plan. Like don't talk down to it because there are people in the class that care about it. Yeah. yeah. Even though you don't care about 30 courses of eternal triangle. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> he's like, he's like, just try to be enthusiastic for the other students. Sure. And then he said, I want to hook you up with one of my good friends, Gary Haas, okay. um, who was the music, the um, music director for Shaka Khan for a bunch of years. Okay. Amazing bass player and producer. Yeah. And he's like, I want you to go over to his house twice a week. I'll call him and here's here's his address. That's what's up. Yeah. So he was the he was the only one that that like cared enough to ask me what I wanted to do. <coughs> yeah. And uh, and I went over there and and Gary would have me play bass on records and he'd be like, all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna sit here and smoke this joint. Like you make a beat. <laughs> okay. You know, and like he you, you know, uh, he would just teach me stuff. Yeah. And uh, and he was super cool. And you know, he would give me like little gigs. He'd be like, hey, if you take my bass. Um, take my bass from 86th Street, which was his place, down to the theater district. I'm playing Lion King tonight. I'll give you 50 bucks. I just you know, cards for him. Yeah, and okay. he would just like throw me little little things like that because I was super broke. Yeah. And um, but that's dope. Then you're like you're in it. You're doing it with the real guys, and you're around the real scene. And yeah, yeah. And then one of my first gigs in New York, um, was uh, was with one of his friends. There was this like this young R&B group, and he told them about me. And uh, I went out to go see their show, and basically they, they liked me, and they liked my playing. And then that's how I actually got my first gospel gig, how okay. I got my first church gig. Yeah. Because the drummer of that group was like, oh, you can play. Um, and me in church was just like, that's a whole other thing, because I was never religious. Okay. And I was approaching church as a gig, right. and like they were not about that at no. all. No. Um, you know, and I got enough shit because my last name is Silverstein, so... <laughs> <laughs> but uh how yeah. big was the band was it just like a trio like drums bass organ drums bass organ and like auxiliary keys okay sometimes there'd be a guitarist yeah but yeah and playing in church that was a whole different thing because like i thought i was hot shit coming from manhattan school of music and like Dude, you know i, I yeah. can i you know my ear is so good and all this kind of stuff man i got my ass me kicked and, me and yaji hamden have talked about this like so many times yeah. like that should be part of schooling. Yeah. Where you have to go hustle your own church gig. Yeah. And that's that's the only gig you can hustle. But it'll teach you the hustle. Right. Of getting your gigs. And that's the gig you need to learn. Right. Like that 
Because they, they play by a different set of rules there. Yeah, and also the church musicians are the ones that are on the pop gigs. Right. Like the gigs you want that are going to pay, they're the ones that yeah. have those. Right. Um, even though they overplay on everything, yeah. <laughs> which, is, which is hilarious. But yeah, so I was getting my ass kicked for like a good solid year because I didn't grow up listening to church music at all. Sure. I grew up listening to, you know, R&B and soul. So I, I had the touch. Right. But um, I just didn't have the vocabulary. Sure. And, um, and that church music, I don't know about what that church was like, but that is a different vocabulary than just like all the old records that are influenced by, you know, the blues and the culture and all those old spirituals. Well, totally. You know, so it, it comes from the origin of the or old spirituals through the blues, through jazz, through mm -hmm. Motown, all that thing. By the time it gets to those records, it's changed. And then the church guys take it somewhere else. And it becomes very, I don't know, maybe maybe I'm going to get a bunch of hate mail for this, but it becomes very instrumentalist. Yes. Yeah. But um, one bass player, you know, like classic R&B soul bass player, Anthony Jackson, yeah. I would say he is so influential to the gospel scene. Okay. Um, in fact, my f probably one of my top three bass players of all time, Sheree Reed. Are you familiar with him? I'm not. Oh, dude, you got to look him up. He's, okay. He's like the most monstrous... I'd say him and Derek Hodge are like the most monstrous bass players. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Sheree is, he has so much Anthony Jackson in him. Okay. And he's like this gospel bass player. Um, he played for R. Kelly for a bunch of years. And now he plays for Corey Henry. Oh, okay. Um, right. Yeah, and he's, he's just like, I think he's the baddest bass player. Like, he's just, he's just the best. And um, he has so much Anthony Jackson in him. Yeah. And he's one of the most influential gospel guys. Like, gospel guys look to him. Okay. So, um, that's more, than, more than like Goucher. Like, uh, I feel like in timeline, Anthony Jackson is older than Goucher. I don't actually know. Anthony's definitely older than Goucher. Yeah. I don't know how old either of them are. Um, to me, I don't know. I I prefer Charay's playing. Okay. Um, and they also just they sound so different. Like I think Charay is from Chicago. Ah. Like that whole Chicago scene of bass playing. Like yeah. Ethan out, out here, right. Ethan Farmer, Damo. Eric Ingram, mm -hmm. Sheree, Maurice Fitzgerald. Yeah. Like, that's just a whole sure. scene. Like, Andrew Goucher to me is so West Coast. Right. Um, which, is, which is awesome. But yeah. the, the Chicago thing, like... It comes from a different place. And I'm super captivated by American geography. And yeah. how, like, the city... Like, they, the Memphis guys got a thing. You know, with, like, Brandon Brown. Yeah. Like, all those dudes got a vibe. Like, Chicago guys got a vibe. Yeah. Some of the Miami guys got a vibe. Mm -hmm. Like, it's... I dig that. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, that happens in, in all the genres. Like, yeah. hip-hop, it's, like, s the most obvious, you know? Right. Um, but, yeah, so so I did the church thing for a while, and then I realized pretty quickly that um, the church, knowing the church musicians was going to be my way onto a gig. Okay. And that's that's kind of what your end game at the time is, is, like, get on a big gig. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, and... I'll, at that point, I always knew that I wanted to produce, but I thought I was going to produce like, you know, in my 30s, which is exactly what I'm doing. Right. But I thought bass was going to like help me produce. And okay. I guess kind of because it got me Grammy nominated. But yeah. like they're answer like basically people don't assume like, oh, yeah, Jamie's an awesome bass player. He must be an awesome producer. Right. Right. Like they don't assume that. And they shouldn't because they're totally ancillary skills. Absolutely. But um, uh, so, yeah. So I was doing the church thing and from the church thing. I started doing like open mics and playing with all the local artists. And then, um, <coughs> then I started getting some better gigs. Um, like I played with uh, Roberta Flack and I played and I subbed with Estelle. Um, my friend DJ Ginyard, an amazing bass player, another okay. lefty. Uh, I subbed for him. It was his gig. And, uh, were these one-offs or were you doing like little runs on the East coast with them? Um, these were just, these were just one-offs to be okay. honest. And, and that was ultimately why I moved uh, back to LA yeah. because like I was at the level or at least right. I thought I was at, I was at the level of my friends who had gigs yeah. and they were all older than me like DJ's older than me Nate Jones um, out okay. in New York he's uh, he's had the Trey Songs gig for like over 10 years I think oh damn and then um, there's this other guy in New York Mitch Cohen who um, he's the MD for Chris Brown okay um, he's he's just done so well for himself but basically there was I was like the next generation yeah. and like they weren't really letting me in. Okay. Um, meanwhile, I had a friend that I went to high school with and actually, yeah, we should talk, we should talk about Jocko. Uh, <laughs> Let's do it. So my friend Jocko Caraco, 
uh, he. Hold on, what is that? His real first name? That's his real name, Jocko Caraco. Wow, but you gotta wonder what the parents were thinking there. Uh, yeah, I don't like know. Th- with the rhyming first names, like I don't know. Uh, that's a different topic. Like, what are you doing to your kids? But whatever. Uh, he's one of the most amazing people I know. Okay. And um, and I'm not I'm not talking shit on the guy. Like I don't know him. I just always find it funny when. Oh yeah, everybody first, comments. Yeah, everybody comments on his name. But basically, me and Jocko were in a band together uh, when we were in high school. We were in. What did um, he play? He played guitar in the band. Okay. He was like the Steve Vai Shredder kind of guitarist. Yeah, yeah. power trio dude. Yeah, and uh, but he played he played jazz sax. Okay. In the band and he shredder was, guitar. Yeah, and he was like, no, I'm not good on sax. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but anyway, so I'm um, I get uh, I get ready to go to Manhattan School of Music, and he goes to USC. Okay. And after our first year of um and. The listeners, you guys will see how this all ties in. This is gonna right. be a, this is gonna be an amazing story. This totally shapes the way that I see music right now. But okay, so we take oh it back. Good. to that, freshman that was year. the original question, right? Right. Yeah. So um, take it back to freshman year, and I think I'm hot shit. I'm like learning odd time signatures and all these solo mm-hmm. transcriptions and all this stuff. And then um, I call up my friend Jocko. It's spring break. I come back. I'm like, Hey, Jocko, what have you been up to, man? Like, let me show you this heavy shit I've been doing. Yeah, you know. Check me out. And and he's like, Man. I got to be honest, I've just been like just wearing my guitar low and uh, and and I just like practice moving around in the mirror. Sometimes I don't even plug in. And I was like, what the fu-? like it was so sacrilegious to me. Like I was so into my shit. Right, right. And uh, and he's like, man, I've just been going on all these auditions like guys <laughs> like my look because he had long hair. Okay. And he dressed like a, uh, who's a guitarist of Bon Jovi. Richard Sambora. He, yeah, he looks like that. OK. And um and basically, he uh, he goes to all these auditions, started winning some auditions, and um, he started getting like really good paying pop gigs. And within two or three years, he got the Miley Cyrus gig. Okay. So by junior year, I'm like just sweating it out, just like doing recitals at the yeah. Manhattan School of Music Coffee House, and he's like buying a house in Calabasas. Yeah, all right. Yeah, and yeah. I was just like, I would just got like kind of pissed about it. Like, right. what the fuck am I doing? You know? Yeah. And, um, right. Because there's no way this is going to equal. No, yeah, that not at all. And the, here, here's, here's the kicker for all of it. I remember I came back to California one time on a break and I'm at Jocko's house. I'm sleeping on his couch, uh-huh. his fucking house that he owns. Right. And, uh, we're just hanging, we're smoking weed. And I'm like, I'm like staying over. And I just asked him, I was like, dude, who are you? You know what I mean? Because basically, when we were in school together, he was like this band nerd, and he played baseball. And now he's just like this cool dude who like can work the room, and he's an amazing networker and yeah. all this shit. And and here I am, still the nerd, like wondering where my nerdy friend went. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he he looked me right in the eye, and he said, "I realized really quickly that my personality and my skill set wasn't going to get me the things I wanted in life. So I created a character who could." Oh man, that's deep. Yeah, it's also kind of sociopathic, but yeah, I, I'd have a lot of questions about that. What's he up to now? Um, I think he's producing and like he does a lot of stuff for Sync. Okay. Um, so like movies and television. Sure. And uh, I'm how sure long? How long did he ride that out with uh, just being a road guy? I still, I think he still does it. Okay. To be honest. Okay. I never met him in town. Yeah. Um, but if he's out all the time, that explains it. Yeah, he's either out all the time or traveling or whatever he's doing but right yeah he basically just like he saw the game from bird's eye view faster than anyone right how old was he how old were you, you guys the same age we're the same age okay and how old what how old were you then when he got his house well when he when he dropped that knowledge about oh and I, I don't know if that's knowledge about creating a character but i do think there's some knowledge in uh it was knowledge for, it was knowledge for me i'd never heard anything like that like to me the the biz the business of music was like being the dopest. Yeah, yeah. And then so to to hear that there was more to the game than just like practicing the most and knowing the most crazy, like to know that there was just levels, to, like it just blew my mind. Right. And he and he just knew that like years before anyone that. That's amazing. Yeah. So that's where you're at then. Like that that's the headspace. It's like you're seeing it from. You're seeing it from this kind of bird's eye view, and but you get the gig, you get the big gig. Miguel, you're yeah. Talking about. Um, well, yeah. Oh, so you were asking me how I got the Miguel gig initially. Yes. Um, so 
Well, and your, I mean, your overall headspace about music, and so that's. Uh, let's come back to that. So, are you, you, you see, you see the game for what it is. And, and I think I'm starting to, but. but and Jocko, Jocko had it right, like Jocko yeah. Caraco, mm-hmm. not Pastorius. Yeah. Um, understood it and did it, and it worked well for him. And now, how much of that did you adopt? How much you're like, oh man, yeah, he's got it together. I have to do that. Like I have to shed my, I have to shed my character chops. You know what? I still don't do it. Right. I still, I still, um, like I, my, one of my idols is Kobe Bryant. Cause I know that I have kind of a, uh, not a grading personality. Like, you know, I'm kind of an acquired taste. Like I'm sure I've offended some people and I'm sure some people are like, fuck yeah. Like yeah. this guy gets it. You e- know? Right. Either you're going to love him or hate it. There, there's no impartial. Right. Like, so, yeah, he's all right. Yeah. yeah. So, so like, I don't. Business partners today, like in the producing world that I'm in, they're like Jamie just, Jamie just doesn't play the game, so he's not going to this meeting. Right. Like, like when it's time to like be straight shooter and make everyone laugh and all that kind of stuff, like Jamie can go to that meeting. Okay. But when it's time to like finesse things a bit, <laughs> right, right, they're right. like, they're like Jamie, we're we're doing this today, but you're not coming. Right. There's not a there's not a chair at the table for you. And there's no argument because yeah. like Cause you don't just, want to be there anyway. Yeah. I, I would just, hate that. Yeah. I'm just like yeah. I'm I'm no finesser. Right. E- even today with artists that I work with, like. If they ask me if they like the song, it's hard for me to, you know, because I can't lie. Like every song that I do, I don't love. Like sure. some sometimes an artist is like, oh, I want to take it in this direction, or you know, thank you for your input, Jamie. But I am going to do this. Like help me do this, and right. you know, I don't love everything. Like, yeah, you don't love every bass gig you've ever done. No, you know, um, no, I don't love you know every gig I'm on. You know, yeah. <laughs> or like everybody in the band that I'm playing with. Yeah, it's I mean, that's like a common misconception for non-music people they're like oh your job must be so amazing you just get to make music all day right yeah until you make music you don't like that's <laughs> definitely it's definitely a fucking job <laughs> with, with dudes that are hard to work with yeah uh, like then it just gets old yeah yeah um we'll save the darkness because i'll i'll end up there with you <laughs> um okay so <clears throat> where are we at in the timeline jocko drops the knowledge you're out here doing gigs you're out here on spring break but you're still living in new york Still living in New York, but then and still still working with that producer back there and just kind of being yeah. a lackey and hoping you're gonna work your way up kind right. of this organic way on the scene. Right. Um. And then, so basically, my second year out of school is when I played with Roberta Flack, and I thought I was gonna get that gig, but I think she was like, "He's too young and whatever," so mm-hmm. she kind of passed on me. I did. That, that's still amazing though, like just to connect with that lineage of music. And yeah. Oh. Yeah. It was. It was. Yeah. It was. It was really cool. Um. And then. A few months later, I did a week at South by Southwest with Estelle, and okay. Estelle was big back then. Yeah, she she had American Boy, so that was Estelle and Roberta Flack were like the biggest things I had done so far, and yeah, and I had that on my resume, and I was telling people, and just like having that leverage, because like I remember being in L.A. To fast forward a little bit, it's like when you kind of fluff up your resume so you can get into better rooms. Sure. And then once you were, once I was able to like not have to fluff yeah. a bit, it, it was like a game changer. Right. Like people really saw me differently after Miguel. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, uh, were you, how, how did you feel about that? Like when, when people were giving you different attention just because of your gig, but it doesn't mean you were playing any different or you were any real different of a musician. Yeah. But like cats are now giving you respect just because of somebody else's name and not yours. Like it's okay. not. It's not based on your merit. It's based on your association. Um, Did you get pissed about that? No, I didn't okay. get pissed. Um, I would laugh Yeah. because I'd see it immediately. But the bottom line is, like, are they bad people for it? Like, human psychology is what it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. You know, every, Just because it's everybody's not, trying to step up and, and yeah. you know. Definitely out here. Especially, especially out here. Yeah. But – um, no, I can't get, I can't get mad about that. Okay. LA just happens to be like the worst town in the world <laughs> for that, but sure. Uh, or the best, depending on perspective, it is the most frequent in this town, you know? Yeah. I mean, this is the town where like, you'll be talking to someone at a party and they're looking over their shoulder Yeah, to see to what's s- up, to see who else they yeah. could, unless yeah. you can drop some names super quick to hold them. Right. Uh, but I mean, I've been on, I've been on both sides of that coin and, uh, I mean, it feels definitely feels better to be on the other side. I'll tell you that. When you're getting the respect. No, when you're getting the re- yeah, when you're getting yeah, the respect. Yeah, when you're getting the respect because you had the big gig. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Um, and now I'm you know working my way 
back to that place as a producer. Yeah. But, um, okay, so yeah, New York. Um, I do the, the w- one week with Estelle. And then after that, for the next year, like nothing really came up. And okay. I, was like, I was like, did I peak in New York? Like I wasn't hearing about any auditions or, or anything. It was just like, man, is New York drying up for me? What year was this? Uh, 2012. Okay. 2000, 2011 or 2012. Okay. And, um, and then, uh, through, through my church connections, I heard of one audition. Actually my whole time in New York, in New York, I think I went on three auditions, Mm -hmm. like literally three. I was there for seven years. Yeah. I auditioned for, um, this girl named Erica Kane, which I actually got, but the, but they ended up firing me because, like, they were all kind of, like, hood dudes and I wasn't hood enough. Okay. And they just didn't like me, even though they liked my playing. But Were they the band based out of New York? Like, everybody from New York? Or were yes. they, like, some L.A. hood guys? No, it was, like, New Jersey hood dudes. Okay. And they just, I don't know, I, I didn't have the right look. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you weren't thug enough? Yeah, I guess not. Uh. And then I auditioned for Joe Thomas, the R&B guy. I didn't get that gig. And then I auditioned for Lady Gaga. Oh, dope. And I obviously didn't get that gig. Right. But there I met this guy, Steve Stiles, mm-hmm. who also didn't get the gig. But he now is the music director for Demi Lovato. So he's okay. he's doing good. Yeah, he's doing all right. He's not mad about it. <laughs> and uh, and I had heard of Steve Stiles. Um, his reputation preceded him because he was like the generation before the Nate Jones and the Mitch Cohens and the guys in New York that were like really doing it. Yeah. And he... I. What I knew of him is he left New York and moved to L.A. and he was doing he was playing bass for Britney Spears when Britney was big. Okay. Um. So he was a little older, and um. I met him and me and him just hit it off and like he he drove me home from the audition back to Harlem in his Lexus and I was like I was like man this guy is like this guy is, he's so successful as a baseball like I'd never seen a local like a musician yeah live the way he not live but I was in his car but you know just I'd never seen that before in sure. New York. I had my friend Jocko at home who was like killing it, but right. all the New York guys were like taking the subway and had their apartments in Harlem. And it's like, no one was like really living that good. Yeah. yeah. But here, this guy's like driving me home in his new Lexus. And I was like, Oh shit. Okay. And, and then, um, me and him just like kind of stay in touch, whatever. And, um, nothing crazy. Like he never, um, I don't think I ever saw him again until years later after the Miguel thing. But basically, I moved to LA and then I'm messaging him on Facebook and I was just like, Hey man, what's going on? Haven't heard from you in a while. He's like, Oh, what's up? You know? And then out of the blue, he just asked me, he goes, Hey, uh, I remember you told me one time that you like San Francisco, like just randomly. And he's like, this guy, Miguel has a gig in San Francisco and I can't make it. Do you want to do it? And I was like, sure. Um, and I, I knew who Miguel was, but he wasn't big or anything back then. Okay. And, uh, and I was like, Sure. How come you don't want to do it? He's like, well, I just got called to play for Demi Lovato. I'm going to try to do both gigs. Of course. So, you know, just let me know how this goes. You can sub for me. Yeah. Right. And um, and then I subbed for him. And it was actually my first time even playing key bass. Okay. And they told me, they're like, don't bring a bass. Really? It was just key bass. It was just key bass. Okay. And uh, I got to the gig. Did you have to go buy one? Did you have a little rig? No, no, no. Okay. They, they just backlined me like a, a move. Okay. And, uh, and I had, I was like practicing the gig on my MIDI keyboard yeah. and I had like made a sub bass tone and all that kind of stuff. And I was, I was into, I was producing by that point. So I was, you know, I could like get around, but, uh, I remember I got there early and, um, the keyboardist was this guy, Derek Cobbs, okay. who's really big now. Like he's, I think he plays for Charlie Puth now. Ooh. Okay. Yeah. He's, uh, he's done super well for himself. So shout out to Derek Cobbs because yeah. he's, he was the guy that like really saved me on the gig because mm. he was i think he was the key he would go back and forth between key bass and keys okay um and basically the keyboardist was leaving so he was taking over keys and then they were looking for a bass player so now i'd be key bass player i guess yeah and basically he set me up with all my tones and then he's like he's like you have to tune the moog and i didn't know that a keyboard would go out of tune so that was just like mind-blowing for I've me i've never i've never played key bass i don't know that world really yeah um it's a fun world. Yeah. Because you can really overplay on a key bass. And, <laughs> and everyone is so into it. I don't need another instrument to do that on. Like <laughs> key, key bass is fun because it's like the attack isn't percussive. It's smooth. Yeah. So you literally can just get away with murder. Right. 
and you know you do you do the wee with your thumb. Yeah. Everyone thinks it's the coolest shit in the world. <laughs> like dude, key bass is such a funny instrument to me. I love it. Okay. But but it, it's a fun one. And uh, yeah, so that was my. I flew up to San Francisco. I played an instrument I never played before live. But you knew the parts. You worked out all the parts yeah. and everything. Okay. And then um. I mean, of course you knew the parts. That's a dumb question. Like you had shedded the parts, right. not on a key bass, is what I meant. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um. Well, I also shed them on my MIDI keyboard. Right. So okay. I. I I wasn't just like totally winging it. Yeah, yeah. But uh, it was still pretty nerve wracking. And then I come back from the gig, and I don't hear from Miguel for a few, for a few months. And I was like, oh, I guess I didn't do that good of a job. Whatever. Right. Um, I come back, and then this guy Steve Octave, this uh, music director from London, calls me, and he goes, Hey, uh, people in town say that you're pretty good. I have this artist that I'm MDing named Cher Lloyd. Um, I want you to come. It's basically between you and this other dude. Okay. Um, what have you been doing lately? Yeah. And I told him, I was like, well, I just got back from San Francisco with Miguel. And yeah. I, ju- I just, I'd literally just done that. Right. And I had something cool to say. And he goes, oh, so you're, you're doing stuff out here. And I was like, I guess. Yeah. yeah I just he did goes, that. He goes, I-, I think you're the guy. And then, oh, okay. and then, um, so Cher Lloyd was like on X Factor or America's got to, she was on one of those kind of shows in, in Britain. Okay. And then that was really my first gig out here. My first consistent gig in LA. Yeah, well, we were we were flying. Um, it was basically like New York, LA, Toronto, just like doing spot dates. Okay. Like TV kind of stuff. Promotionals. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so you, you moved out here, and then you got the then you got Miguel, or you got Miguel through New York, and then moved out here with Miguel. I moved out here and was doing like church gigs and all that kind of stuff for like the first year. Okay. And um, and then Steve Styles, I message him on Facebook and then that's when that happened. That's how that happened. But but I was I was hustling um you know going to Libertine and all the Yeah, yeah. Yeah, for like the first year. Sure. And um and then I got the call from Miguel, then I come back uh then I start playing with Cher Lloyd and then here's where Miguel comes back in. I'm doing South by Southwest with Cher Lloyd and Miguel's opening for Cher Lloyd. Oh. And Miguel's like, "Hey, what are you doing here?" Yeah. And I was like, oh, "I'm playing with Cher Lloyd." And he knows he's opening for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that just puts you in another. Yeah. Yeah. And then literally that weekend, he's like, hey, I got a bunch of dates. You want to do them? Killer. And then. Okay. It's five years later, you know. All right. We're going to hit pause on the conversation with Jamie. Uh, that is episode one. I think we can all agree that it really is. A safe space, huh? Can we can we just take a minute, let that soak in? Can we marinate in that? This is a safe space. Hashtag safe space. Uh, stick around for the second half of the conversation in episode two, and uh, Jamie and I will continue to rant and air frustrations about uh, music and things related to it. Uh, thanks.